Okay, as some of our longtime viewers may know, the rest of you may not, this is a 1990 Volkswagen uh, pickup truck. Um, you may not have ever seen one before. They're quite rare in the United States. Uh, in Germany, they're called the Doppelkabin or double cabin because they have a back seat as well as a front and their pickup truck. Uh, this one, we have uh, put Tesla wheels on it, but more importantly, a Tesla drive unit underneath it. And therein lies the tail. I got this from Otmar Ebenhake, Otmar Ebenhake, Ebenhake. You know, I, he's corrected me on that several times. I still don't know. Uh, Otmar was one of the pioneers of replacing the early Curtis PWM controller for DC motors with a high power version called the Zilla, which did a thousand amps. The, I think the original Curtis did about 350 and then later 550. They wanted to race on the West Coast and so Mark came up with a version uh, using the same parallel MOSFET um, technology of the day uh, to do it at 1,000 amps and later at 2,000 amps, making it possible to do some very powerful uh, DC-powered cars. He had this and, kind of like me, had too many projects, and so I bought this from him for a stupid amount of money, but it's kind of a rare bird. It's, um, there may not be, I would say, a hundred of them in the United States, and I don't know where 90 of them are. You just don't see them, and there's a reason. And it's called the chicken tax. And uh, in the early 1960s, the German farmers were very incensed that um, American chicken conglomerates were selling chickens in Germany for less than their costs of production. Does this sound familiar? Um, they talked the German government into passing a chicken tax. Now, it wasn't a tax against the United States or a tariff against the United States. It was just on chickens. And so most of the imported chickens came from the United States. President Johnson responded by passing a 25% tariff on light commercial vehicles. The, at that time, the only manufacturers in the world to make light commercial vehicles was Volkswagen. And so, throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s and to today, Volkswagen has been very popular in America, but you'll never, almost never see a pickup truck or a panel van because those are industrial vehicles, uh, like commercial vehicles. And you have to pay a 25% tariff to import them, which is a pretty big tariff on a car. Um, a few came into Canada and Mexico and eventually made their way into the United States, and that's the case here. But almost none were imported directly into the United States. As also, as many of our longtime viewers know, um, we kind of got involved with Azure Dynamics and their eTransit Connect. The Transit Connect is a Ford vehicle, but it's made in Turkey or Romania and imported to the United States. They're a delightful little van, a utility van. They're good for, uh, not for heavy hauling, but for floor shops, um, you know, residential pest control shops, pharmacies use them to deliver pizza, um, you know, light delivery chores. And they're inexpensive, about $23,000 for a uh, gasoline powered one. Azure Dynamics thought it would be a great idea to make it electric, I agree and they decided to sell it for $58,700. I don't agree with that. And apparently, uh, only 286 people ever did then. But a curious thing happened along the way. We found out that the Transit Connects come into the US in New Jersey, from Turkey or Romania, wherever it is. And they have glass windows in the sides and a seat in the back. 
And in New Jersey, they take out the glass windows and the seats, shred them right on site with a big shredder, and put in a metal panel. And now it's a light industrial vehicle, but they didn't have to pay the 25% tariff because it had seats and glass in it, and so it was a passenger vehicle. This is the kind of crazy stuff that you get into with tariffs and trade wars and so forth. Um, governments should not be involved in business. All they can do is distort it and it's rife with unintended consequences. And to correct the unintended consequences, they have to go back and revise the original regulations. And it's a slippery slope toward having a centrally planned economy, which the Soviet Union demonstrated so ably leads mostly uh, to poverty and eventually the dismemberment of the Soviet Union. Uh, today, the Soviet Union, or Russia, and China, previously two communist countries, um, are kind of leading the U.S. in some ways in um, their free capital market spirit. Uh, a, a interesting irony. Um, Winston Churchill said it best that uh, democracy is, or capitalist uh, ec economies, are the very unfair and inequitable distribution of wealth. Uh, socialist or communist economies are the very equal, a very fair and very just distribution of poverty. And that's the problem with the whole thing. You have to be careful what you do. So I, for a long time, have not been in favor of tariffs. And in fact, I'm not in favor of subsidies. I don't think it's appropriate that we have a 30% tax credit for solar installations. And I don't think it's appropriate to have a $7,500 tax credit for electric vehicles. Now, I'm not above taking advantage of them if that's the uh, law of the land, but I do not approve of it. And the reason is it distorts the market and true demand. People make decisions every day, and millions of them make decisions every day on what to buy, what to sell, and what not to buy, and what not to sell. And uh, indeed, in a complex economy like ours, there are huge allocations of capital over long periods of time to build plants and hire and employ people and so forth that the sudden application of subsidies distorts and the sudden removal of them distorts further. For these reasons, I oppose them. Uh, I'd like for everyone to have a transparent and cl clear view of the true demand for any product. Um, unfortunately, it gets a little complicated in that we have huge subsidies and tax breaks for fossil fuels, for example. And so how do you level that out when we're talking about a renewable? Let's do another example. A uh, digital single lens reflex still camera that uh, made really quite good videos. I liked that because I could use some uh, advanced lenses. I had a very nice Rode microphone on top of it and used it for close-ups and so forth. And so we could have two camera switching between uh, the scenes. Uh, it had one irritating feature and that was it would, at 29 minutes and 59 seconds, it would just shut off. That was no big deal, you could just shut it back on, but as many of you know, I uh, sometimes go on at length um, in repetition and ad nauseum. Uh, 30 minutes is uh, not enough time for me sometimes. And so this camera would run out while I was still waxing poetic. Uh, so I went to replace it and I looked at all the other ones and uh, would you believe that all of them have this feature. And of course, as part of our online marketing thing, we were entering a new phase where anything negative is buried 300 levels deep. You have to know somebody to find out about it. Uh, but I can tell you that all um, digital single lens reflex 
cameras have a limitation of something under 30 minutes for video. Uh, I've been told this is because the chip gets hot or the chip can't keep up or all of it's bullshit. The reason it, they stop at 23 minutes, 59 seconds is the EU has a quite high tariff on video equipment. But a dig digital single lens reflex camera does not get the tariff applied to it because it's under 30 minutes of video. You see, to be a video camera, you have to be able to take at least 30 minutes of video under the EU tariff for video cameras. And so this is the kind of nonsense that happens when uh, severely stupid people uh, get to play in government and try to think they know something about businesses. And uh, so the EU tariff is the reason for this stupid limitation on our cameras here in the United States. The cameras are made in Korea or Japan, but they don't want to have a different model for the U.S. than for the EU, and so we're stuck with the same limitation. This week, uh, Donald Trump uh, announced some tariffs on solar panels. It's been fascinating for me, uh, not because of interest in solar panels, but because it's kind of an encapsulated and fairly easy for me to get my head around example of how dicked up our news media has gotten. They have gotten every single part of this story upside down and backwards, and 99 to 100% of all the people who advocate renewable energy, solar energy, electric vehicles, as I do, are convinced that this is an enormous setback uh, for the genre and truly a death blow by a tyrannical and viciously stupid man. How, how do we get there? This is just craziness. Nobody gets to survive 30 or 40 years in Manhattan real estate by being stupid. In fact, he may be one of the brightest guys I've come across, certainly on par with Elon Musk and probably exceeding him. Unfortunately, I know a little bit more about this than I quite want to or should. This is a solar panel that we sell. Now, why do we sell solar panels at all? Well, the overlap between electric vehicles and solar energy has been uh, very deep. I'd say it's 95% VETCH diagram here, uh, overlap, um, from the beginning. The EV people want to drive on sunshine, and the solar people want to be able to drive their houses. This is a panel made by Jackson Fu, an entrepreneur in China, and it's flexible. It's six pounds, it's three and a half millimeters thick, and you can bend it. In fact, you can't really keep it straight. Why is this important? For boats or truck tops or RV tops, you can do away with all that structure to mount thick, heavy solar panels and put this down with an adhesive on the top of your boat, on the top of your boat deck. You can walk on it um, or the top of your RV and it has no profile. It can take the curve of the roof or the curve of the deck, and it's only three and a half millimeters thick. It's very thin. More importantly, these particular panels are very efficient. On boats or trucks or RVs, you don't have unlimited rooftop, so you need the most power for the least area. These use sun power, um, monocrystalline uh, cells. Sun power right now is the most efficient, <clears throat> widely produced monocrystalline cell in the world. They come from a company called Sun Power, who is a U.S. solar panel manufacturer and proudly proclaims that all their products are made in the USA. They actually run a scam, right, a scam, where you have to be 
a certified installer to install the panels, and I dare you to find the price of a sun power panel anywhere online. The installers love this because you can't shop them online to see what their costs are for the panels, and um, sun power uh, can charge anything they want for them. It's all kind of a secret. Um, here's the other interesting fact about that. Sun power, the all-American made solar panel, doesn't make any of their solar panels. <laughs> all the cells are made in the Philippine Islands. That's right, all the sun power cells are made in the Philippines in Asia. <clears throat> in 2012, a German company called Solar World AG in 2010 actually started pestering the uh, Commerce Department to apply tariffs to Chinese solar panels um, to protect their factory in the U.S., even though they're a German company. Uh, in 2012, under the Obama administration, uh, they did apply a tariff to Chinese monocrystalline modules, the cells. And in 2014, they bumped that. And they had a, a schedule of 59 Chinese companies that were varying rates from 51% to 250% tariffs. And these tariffs are very interesting for me in that the way they were administering them is you could go ahead and order the panels and you could receive them. They'd just send you a letter six months later requiring you to pay U.S. Customs duties of 150% that you didn't know anything about. Fortunately, this panel is made in China, but the cells are made in the Philippine Islands. And this Obama administration tariff only applied to China. And so we were able to continue to import them, but I have about 45 days of terror with every shipment with them locked up in customs in Cincinnati while I send them the same paperwork I did three months ago, establishing that the cells were indeed sourced from the Philippine Islands, tracking them to China to the installation of the panel and those panels from thence to me to avoid a 150% tariff on the Chinese panels. This, this is kind of dicked up. Um, so this w past week, the Trump Administration Commerce Department International Trade Commission announced a tariff against Asian solar panels. Everybody in the press started spewing statistics that many are actually correct. But like children, eight-year-olds loose in a nuclear power plant control room, they can spell on, they can spell off, but they don't have any idea what the levers do. 60% of all solar panels in the world are made in China. This is true. Uh, in fact, in another governmental blunder of epic proportions, the Chinese government recognized an oversupply of solar panels about 18 months ago. And so they notified all the factories in China belong to the cities. The city owns the factory and the, the jobs are patronage jobs. And the people you deal with in China to buy them are traders who buy them out of the factories and sell them to people in the US. It's a little bit different system. Uh, they announced that any city that did not produce one gigawatt hour of solar panels would be shut down. They're gonna shut down all the little ones uh, by the end of that year. Well, guess what happened? Uh, by the end of the year, every single city in China that had a solar panel factory announced that they had magically 
uh, gone over the one gigawatt threshold and would not, not be, have to, to shut down their factory. The result was solar panels going worldwide um, for less than the variable costs of the materials that go in the panel, never mind the cost of the factory. Um, and, and the result is that 60% of the panels in the world come from China. Interestingly, if you get online and look for all these cheap solar panels, you won't find them. There are no Ying Lee solar panels or any of that. And there weren't before the Obama administration tariff. They mostly go to Saudi Arabia and Germany and India for very large scale utility grade uh, 600, 800 megawatt hour plants and American companies just can't compete with them in that venue and for that reason. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Trump's announcement of a tariff on Asian solar panels ostensibly arises and the statistics are quoted that 80 percent of the parts that people use to put solar installations on your roof uh, come are imported. And that's true. Um, the rest of it gets a little hazy. This uh, ostensibly uh, arises out of a company called Suniva, who uh, filed for protection um, from Asian imports. Suniva is an almost wholly owned uh, subsidiary of Xinfeng uh, Clean Energy Limited. That's a Hong Kong company in China. Guess who shows up again as the 300-pound um, gorilla in this um, situation? Solar World AG. So Trump has announced a tariff. What does it mean? Well, in the first place, it applies to all Asian solar panels. Now we said that 80% of the parts that we use to install solar is imported. And so you thought, since China is 60% of the solar panels in the world, that it's mostly China. This is not so. 36% of the US imports of solar panels come from Malaysia. 21% comes from Korea. Um, 9% comes from Thailand. Vietnam produces more solar panels into the U.S. market than China does. China is 8% of the imported solar panels into the U.S. 17% all other is mostly Japan. And so we have an interesting thing that happened. Now let's walk this through. Trump made a trip to Asia. Uh, last summer, and he was extremely warmly received in China and somewhat strangely received in Korea. My father fought in Korea in 1952. We currently, 65 years later, have 28,000 U.S. military people stationed in U.S. bases in Korea. This is billions of dollars annually to defend a country that has a very strong economy and could easily field an army that could wipe out seven North Koreas. I have no idea what we're doing there 65 years later. Uh, Trump actually said during his campaign he didn't either and was going to knock that shit out and let them pay for their own army. And apparently the generals have kind of talked him out of that, part of our military industrial complex. Anyway, very nice visit with the Chinese, somewhat cooler one with Korea. In December, China dropped or cut dramatically the tariffs and import duties on 187 different consumer goods, mostly coming from the U.S. In January, Trump announces a 30% tariff against Asian imports of solar panels. Wait a minute. China was already facing 30 to 250 percent 
and all the countries they compete with over there didn't have any tariffs. Now all of a sudden China is at 30%, but so is Korea and Malaysia and Japan and the Philippines and Thailand and Vietnam. And so what's actually happened in January of 2018 is Trump has given the Chinese relief on solar tariffs and leveled the playing field where they're not at a disadvantage for U.S. sales vis-a-vis -vis Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Japan, the Philippine Islands. So none of this really happens in a vacuum. Trump's a very bright guy. He's, above all, a deal maker, and this is a deal. Um, there's some interesting uh, things about this for Tesla. Recall that Tesla acquired his cousin's company, Solar City. Solar City had acquired another company, and it's almost like Ceneva, but it's Centiva and their Tri-X hybrid thin film technology. They, Solar City paid $327 million for this company. They had a hybrid technology that was a sandwich of amorphous thin film on both sides of some small monocrystalline uh, cells. Uh, amorphous thin film is much less expensive to manufacture and does not have near the efficiency of the monocrystalline uh, cell. But by combining the two of them, Santiva had claimed that they could reach 18% while achieving the manufacturing um, efficiencies of amorphous thin film like for solar. And that's what drove the Solar City acquisition of their company for $327 million. But it also drove something else. The state of New York ponied up $750 million to, uh, I think, 450 in plant and 350 in equipment to build a factory for uh, Ceneva and Ceneva and uh, eventually uh, Solar City. Um, but, I mean, it was originally 250 million, then it went to 750 million. But the obligation was that um, the Solar City put in $5 billion in investment and uh, have 5,000 jobs in Buffalo, uh, New York, by a date certain. In 2015, that was modified. The force majeure clause in the contract, and that is um, forces you don't have any control over that would nullify the contract, was amended to include any um, governmental actions and specifically named tariffs. Um, without the tariffs, Solar City, now Tesla, uh, would have to pay $41 million a year in penalties to the state of New York for each year they failed to achieve 5,000 jobs and a $5 billion investment. But with the tariff um, just employed by T Trump, they don't have to pay anything. They're just out of the contract. They don't have to build the factory at all. Um, they don't have to invest anything in it. And New York already has. They can't get their money back and they can't get anything from Tesla. Meanwhile, the Centiva uh, technology, Tri-X, didn't work. When they went to scale it up, they found their manufacturing costs went higher than if they just used monocrystalline cells. And so uh, the whole thing has collapsed into an ugly mess. And there's probably some New York state officials that are going to go to jail over it. It would appear that Tesla and Solar City are going to skate free. Uh, the real obligations were from the parent company, which Solar City and Tesla never quite assumed, 
But in any event, this amendment to the force majeure lets them out with the enactment of the Trump uh, tariff. Uh, a very interesting sidelight. Panasonic and Tesla have done a non-binding letter of intent to produce Panasonic's hetero something junction um, semiconductor uh, Flavus Waven HIT uh, panels in that Buffalo factory. And if you'll recall, the Panasonic HIT was the panel I selected for our test array here at EVTV. It's a very good panel, about 19%, and it is a hetero junction uh, hybrid sandwich of um, amorphous thin film and monocrystalline uh, cell that is up about 19%, and apparently they can produce them somewhat economically, although I have to say I paid kind of a premium form. I think they're about $325 to $345 right now for a 300-watt uh, panel. But it's a premium panel, no doubt about it. The rest of it. Oh, my God. They've got things. So this is going to be the end of the solar industry and the end of 260,000 jobs. Um, um, Bloomberg has about the only serious data on this, I think. Um, basically, it could result in a 10 cent um, per watt uh, increase in solar panel costs. Uh, that would put them at about the price they were at the end of 2016, so you're not going to notice. That's number one. Number two, the solar panel costs have dropped to about 20% of the price of the installation uh, on a residence. What's happened in the last two years is the solar installers have been getting panels less expensively. But they've kind of held their prices and not mentioned it to the people they're quoting solar installations on. Um, and so their share of profit and overhead has grown. Uh, they've kind of kept the savings in the panels for themselves. They can give it back now and still not be hurt. In other words, there won't be a single residential installation of a solar application not happen because of this tariff. None. Zero. If you are being quoted a solar installation, you may hear from the person quoting it that the price is high because of, you know, Trump and the uh, thing understand they're lying to you. It's bullshit. They're stealing from you. And that's the way it is. Bloomberg's estimate would be about a 3.3% impact on residential. Somewhat higher, about 9% even, but that would be uh, not industrial, but actually utility grade large-scale projects and um, so those conceivably could be put off but again you're talking about setting them back a year to the prices of 2016 so I don't think any of that's going to happen 260,000 solar jobs at risk none but if there are any jobs at risk let's stop and think about this do any of you know a solar installer they tend to be single operator, sole proprietors, or sole owners of an LLC, sometimes a partnership, uh, who run the company, and all the guys on the roof putting up the solar panels are working for 8 to 12 bucks an hour. They're 24 years old. They have no health benefits. They're in the heat. They're in uh, a, a dangerous situation uh, with some safety issues and they're barely being paid above minimum wage. 38,000 of the 260,000 jobs are in factories. They're the ones who might benefit. I don't think they'll benefit very much, but the, uh, in theory would benefit. Those people get 58 to $75,000 a year. They have full health benefits, and they're working for a publicly traded 
publicly listed corporation. So that's the difference there. There were just so many things dicked up in the presentation of this that I, it, it's hard to unwind all of it. Um, I don't favor tariffs, but the reporting on this one was abysmal. These people couldn't follow a story into the men's room. Some of these journalists are getting 10, 15 million dollars a year to be on camera and they couldn't find their ass with both hands and all their kids' hands strapped to their hip pockets. It's incredible. None of them did any work at all to track this stuff down. It's not that hard. There's a fact sheet on the Obama tariffs on the ITC website now. It, th none of this is a secret. It's readily available information. Any moron can put this together. The Trump tariff would be a net positive for China. It's not really damaging to the US solar or renewables industry at all. Um, it kind of levels the playing field between China and the rest of the Asian countries. It was probably part of a cunning uh, table deal between Trump and China resulting from their meeting last summer. Uh, most importantly, it caused the drop in duties on the uh, 187 consumer products going into China. So some modest steps progress there. Um, it's true, China and many countries subsidize their products. In other words, I can buy these panels for about 15% less than a Chinese can. I can buy Australian wine, by the way, which I had a pilot at one time that just drove him crazy. He was from Australia. I can buy Australian wine here for about 15% less than you can in Australia. So governments do subsidize products. Again, none of these things, for whatever good reasons they're entered into, ever really play out as being much of a public good. Stay with us. A couple of final notes on uh, the uh, solar tariffs. Um, in the first place, it, the first 2.5 gigawatt hours of uh, solar equipment imported is exempt, no tariff at all. Second, the tariff declines over four years from 30% to 15%. But I was mentioning Korea and the cool reception that Trump got there. Whirlpool has made washers and dryers all my life, and they have been suffering somewhat. Uh, the uh, first 1.2 million washers or dryers imported into the country will have a 20% uh, tariff applied to them, and uh, any over that will have a 50% tariff applied to them, and um, there's about 1.6 million imported each year. Uh, by far, uh, the vast majority of all of that comes from Korea, Samsung, and LG Kim. And so, uh, or LG uh, Electronics. And so, uh, uh, Korea's gonna get spanked on solar equipment but most severely on washers and dryers. And Whirlpool and their workers are cheering that. Whirlpool says that'll mean a, an additional 200 jobs, not a big impact, but some, and should stabilize their uh, decline. And so that's uh, uh, the rest of that story. Tesla has a couple of things going on. One, they've had another autopilot crash this one in Culver City, California. A guy plowed into a firefighter truck that was parked in the left lane um, at 65 miles an hour. Now, there was a couple of not noticeable things about that, or notable things. One was Tesla's response. They're now um, asserting that it's really the driver's responsibility to maintain control of the car, and they're not really to blame for this. 
Um, I went over this three, four years ago. How, why would manufacturers who by and large, unless they're proven to be actually criminally covering up defects in their products that are killing people, largely have a, a pass on auto wrecks. The presumption is that it's the driver, and if it's a mechanical defect, it's, the presumption is the driver should have been maintaining the car. When you start talking about autopilot, you uh, start to assume some of that responsibility. Tesla was basically claiming their car could drive itself. Uh, since then, their tune has changed. There was, of course, a fatality in Florida. A guy was watching a Harry Potter movie, and a white truck came out into the road, and uh, uh, the Tesla went under the truck and decapitated him. Um, but their tune is changing uh, in that somehow, despite assuring people, and the, advantage, the example I used was the 24-year-old girl in the courtroom saying, Your Honor, I thought the car was driving. It said so on the website. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. Uh, and Tesla's claiming the driver should have been driving the car. And uh, um, the driver's like, I was on autopilot. And uh, the second notable thing, other than Tesla's furious backpedaling on their legal position in autopilot crashes, was the guy walked away from the crash unhurt. This is a 65 mile an hour direct crash into a fire truck and the guy walks away. He, do, he doesn't even go to the hospital. They tried to get him to ride in an ambulance at least get checked out. He said, no, I'm fine. And so the Tesla car really is quite safe. I had reversed myself in a sort of a kumbaya uh, moment of glorious fantasy over the uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, 8 teraflop card that they were using. I don't care how much hardware you put on it. It's an impossible software uh, problem. Understand that I've been waiting for something to load, something to save, or something to print since 1979 in assembly language. And this is not doable, guys. There's, it's just too varied an environment. Autopilot is, it can be like a super cruise control. It can be a lot more useful, but it's never, there's not gonna be any autonomous driving in my lifetime. It's just not gonna happen. Every introduction of it is going to, uh, um, mean um, another death. And um, General Motors has announced that they're way out ahead of Tesla uh, in autopilot uh, development, autonomous driving. It's a fantasy. There are two deaths at least, or two serious crashes behind. Until you've killed a couple of dozen people with this, you're not even a player. And I don't think that it's uh, anything imminent, and I, I believe it'll be a long time in coming at all. It's just a very hard problem to work in software, and that's where it has to be worked. My Tesla Model S automatically opens the garage door when I come home, and it closes it uh, when I leave. And it does that about a third of the time. It also has a nifty feature. I can press a button on the steering wheel and ask it to play any song by any person uh, I want to. And it'll go out on the internet, on Slacker or something, and find the song and play it. About a third of the time. This has gotten to be entertainment in our car, and we love it. My wife and I just have so much fun with this. We'll push the button, name a song and an artist, and we can't wait to see what we're gonna hear. We wanna hear Bon Jovi Hallelujah. And here comes the sound of music, uh, The Hills Are Alive. Uh, and we can ask for Judy Garland somewhere over the rainbow, and we get Led Zeppelin. It's, it's just hilarious. 
Now, if you want to drive my car at 70 miles an hour with me on it, autonomously, you first have to show some serious competence in the areas of garage door opening and music playing. If you can't do that, I don't want to talk to you about autonomous driving. It's not happening. Tesla has some neat stuff going though. They have now spotted on the pad, ready to launch, may not be ready to launch, but it's moved to the pad, the Falcon Heavy, the largest launch vehicle in the history of the world since the Saturn V. And guess what's going to be on the very first launch? He's going to put in solar orbit forever. It will rotate around the sun just like the Earth and Mars, in between Earth and Mars, a Tesla brilliantly red Roadster. I think, it, I mean, it's just the sort of thing that tears my sense of whimsy up. This is vintage Elon Musk. I can't applaud it highly enough. It's just brilliant marketing. Um, when you get finally do get to Mars, there could be a Tesla Roadster waiting for you. Finally, with regards to Tesla, the Tesla short sellers I had mentioned. There was a whole group out there on an online service who lived to short Tesla stock. Tesla has about a 24% short float. And what that means is people have sold the stock with the expectation that it'll go down. And they get the money for the stock when they sell it and they buy it back uh, when it goes down and they get to keep the difference unless it goes up. Um, Tesla is the third most shorted stock in the world. Alibaba is actually number one with a $20 billion short overhang. And uh, Pin Ang, Ping An Insurance Company in China is number two with a $16 billion overhang. Tesla at about 24% of their shares outstanding. Um, have about $10 billion in overhang um, of short sellers. And I mentioned that these poor people on this uh, online site um, were living out of their cars and in overpass um, in cardboard boxes and stuff at this point. I wasn't far wrong. In 2017, they took a 3.517 billion dollar mark to market loss on the short sale since the 1st of January and this is the 25th uh, they're down another 1.1 billion dollars and so the shorts is the gift that just keeps on giving now the uh, interesting thing about that to watch for is called capitulation um, it has a couple of causes. Uh, the number one cause is they do this on margin quite a bit, and they have to have at least 50% in the game. So as the price of the stock goes up, they get margin calls and have to put more cash into the account, or their position is forcibly liquidated. And it's sold at market, and they get whatever's there. And so at that point, their losses are realized, and their account uh, winds up in a, the negative uh, situation. Um, the other form of capitulation is, how many times am I going to play this game and get my sock stolen? Um, I'm throwing it in. Uh, and they simply get out. That leads to what I call capitulation can be sudden. People are kind of groupthink animals. I call it the rush to the exits. To get out of your short position, you have to buy shares to cover your short position. You've sold a thousand shares short, and you have to buy a thousand shares of Tesla stock to clear that short and liquidate your position 
and now you're, you're done. You, whatever your loss was, was your loss. Whatever your gain was, was your gain. But you, you've traded in and you've traded out. Um, well, if several people uh, go to cover, uh, that's going to cause a demand on the stock and the price to go up. Well, everyone has a different threshold of pain, but as the stock goes up, um, the uh, margin calls for sales start to go into play and people start to capitulate voluntarily and, um, and that causes more purchases of the stock and the stock price to rise. And I call it the rush to the exits. Uh, the last man out the door really gets clobbered uh, because he's covering and usually forced to cover um, at a phenomenal price. And so you can see outlandish uh, zooms in the price of a stock uh, that has no basis uh, in valuation of the stock. It's simply a rush to the exit by the shorts. And, um, and they just get killed in it. Of course, it's like a bubble bursting and away they go uh, for the exits and there's no limit on the losses and there's no top to what the stock price can be. You see Tesla, $5,000 a share. Now once all the shorts are covered, it's going to come back to a valuation based on expectations of success. Um, but that's gonna be colored by the history of the stock having gone to this ridiculously high level uh, because of the rush to the exits by the shorts. And so that bears watching, they already lost over three and a half billion dollars out of a $10 billion overhang in 2017. And they've taken another $1.1 billion haircut the first month of this year. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out when the Model 3 does actually start to ship. Um, so keep an eye on that. Okay, this is gonna be a quick one. Here is our latest production model from my guy in uh, California who sent us 10 um, full pack controllers and I'm quite taken with these. We've got our USB port, our CAN Ethernet jack, RJ45, our power switch, negative contactor, positive contactor. Here's, of course, our blades going to the battery. Our charge enable output, 12 volt output, in a really nice professional package that I'm quite taken with. We've been doing some interesting experiments, as I promised having to do with uh, the uh, running two packs in parallel and connecting them at different states of charge. Recall, if you will, that we had connected one at uh, oh, 93% and 63%, about a 30% different, kind of peaked at 120 something amps and tapered off and I showed you all that. We wanted to see how far that could go. So we went to basically 97% state of charge and ran one down to 25% and then hit the magic buttons and connected them using contactors uh, to each other. And it failed. Um, what happened was the one that came on second uh, kicked off immediately and it's the Tesla battery management system inside the battery that's kicking off and it apparently has a current limit um, that we think is about 300 amps. It could be 275, but I think it's right at 300 amps, which at 400 volts would be 120 kilowatts, which is about the maximum power of the current Tesla superchargers. So they are monitoring the amount of current coming into the battery and simply do not allow anything over a certain maximum point. We think that point is about 300 amps. 
And so at 25% um, state of charge and at 97% uh, on the other one, uh, we were basically kicking out and not, uh, not able to do the transfer. Surprisingly, I increased that to 30% uh, on, charge the lower battery up to 30% and would you believe everything got to be magically better and we can close them and we can charge them but it's fairly dramatic we uh, let me put this graph up here um, we had one pack at 396.19 volts and the other one was at 341.76 volts and um, when we connected them together it surged to about 255 amps uh, peak. Now it may have been higher than that in a very short increment of less than 20 milliseconds, but not enough to weld the contactors even when we did the higher uh, disparity. And this seemed to peak about 255 amps, 91, almost 92 kilowatts of power and then it dropped fairly dramatically but it took four minutes to get down to 180 amps and as you can see from our curve here after an hour we're still putting 10 amps into that battery so it's a big transfer of power the two batteries both went to about 360 for 65 volts, 365 volts at the end, and it brought it up from 30% to 62% state of charge in an hour. And so that's not a supercharger with three phase power behind it, that's simply one battery to the next, and with a peak current of uh, 255 amps. I'm gonna put this other similar graph up same uh, event but it shows the rise in state of charge and um, with the fall in current uh, through the 62 minute charge period that we logged and we logged this data uh, there's some built-in logging on the Tesla battery controller it can save on the minute up to 13 days I think uh, if you set it to five minutes, it'll do 57 days. In the EEPROM, on the EVTV can do a uh, board. And so we can print that out in human readable form, but we can also list it in comma separated values and suck those right into Microsoft Excel. And that's how I made these graphs. You can too. And so um, that's kind of a feature of it. But this test is um, kind of important to me um, for a couple of reasons. Looking forward, uh, we already have one guy that wants to put like 15 Tesla batteries in an array. <laughs> it's actually doable. Um, and I mean Tesla full packs. Um, he already has a 400 kilowatt photovoltaic array. Um, so some of these guys think pretty big. Uh, so can you use two Tesla battery packs in parallel? Well, of course you can. What if um, they get out of phase? One of them kicks off and the other one keeps charging. Now they're not equal. Don't worry about it. It doesn't have to be equal. And it doesn't have to be equal uh, in a range of about 60% uh, state of charge difference this thing can can do it just fine at 70% um, difference it kind of doesn't because you exceed the um, value of the in, inrush current on the uh, the lower battery and uh, it really isn't an inrush current one of the things I wanted to see is and I knew the answer but you still have to do this and and here's why case in point we found a trip point in the Tesla battery management system 
where, beyond which there lie beasts, they will simply will kick it off. And, um, and our box sort of monitors that stream from the um, Tesla BMS. And if it disconnects its contactors, we do too. And so there's uh, uh, a shutoff. But that's at 97% state of charge in one and about 25% state of charge in the other. At 97 and 30, it worked fine. The cables didn't even get warm. We increased the temperature of the batteries from, um, let's see, I've got this on one of the graphs, I think. Um, you know, I didn't include it. Oh yeah, here it is. Our start temp was 15 degrees C and our end temp was 26 degrees C. Well, that, that's, you know, that's a, a uh, notable increase in temperature. It tells me we're doing something, but understand that 26 degrees centigrade is about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It's uh, room temperature. And so um, we don't have a temperature problem with an hour of heavy charging. Uh, starting at 255 amps and tapering to 10, there's no thermal issue at all. Our cables didn't even increase in temperature. And these are one aught uh, cables, I think. They might be one aught, but I think they're one aught. Um, no, those are one aught. And uh, uh, so not very big cables, uh, but I wanted some size, again, this 300 to 400 volt um, stuff, you could use uh, normal Romex house wire would be overkill for these things um, at the currents they normally produce to do power. Now, I'm not sure that's the case if you have a 400 kilowatt system, but for most of us, uh, that would be plenty. We're kind of set up here so I could do this test and see what it was. 255 amps is non-trivial, particularly when you're doing it for longer than like an acceleration in a car. We were over 200 amps for three or four minutes. Um, but it did come down and it came down fairly sharply down to about 170 amps and then it was more gradual uh, down to, uh, uh, but it was still doing 10 amps after an hour. And so um, uh, it's very doable to use two batteries side by side. And within uh, some very wide parameters, uh, you don't have to worry about them being at the same state of charge. Hook them up, push the button. And they will equalize themselves just fine. Uh, longer term for me, I'm looking to hook up a car uh, and charge the car or use the car to augment my batteries without taking it out of the car using a charge plug. And that's gonna be a little bit more interesting. The point is that normally when doing this sort of thing, you want to use DC to DC converters, pulse width modulation to do a very controlled ramp up and ramp down and conversion from one voltage and current to another. That's how it's done, but at these power levels, dealing with two or three 85 kilowatt packs, understand that that's $15,000 and 500 pounds of electronics. Um, how about we just hook it up with a couple of contactors and uh, film the explosion. And basically it's a non-event. We're not even welding contactors. Uh, this is uh, currents, they're measurable currents, they're impressive currents, but they're not anything that we need to fear at all. Uh, and we can simply connect this stuff up and uh, let it rip basically. Um, and, and really our, our cabling and bus bars and stuff didn't even increase in temperature. It was a non-event. So skipping the huge conversion switching power supplies that you normally use to do these translations and just hooking up 
an 85 kilowatt battery capable of, you know, uh, 1,000 amps or more to another one uh, seems like madness, and actually it ain't even a thing. Uh, if you uh, are doing too much of it, one of them will shut down. How do you get well? Hook a charger up to it by itself. Bring it up a little closer to the other one and do it again, and then one will charge the other one, they'll equalize out. And you wind up essentially with one battery um, of 150 kilowatt hours maybe. We call this 85 kilowatt hours. As best I can tell, they're truly about 75, and we have been um, subjected to some interesting marketing speak. Uh, I'm uh, kind of rating these really uh, in experiments of measuring currents out and currents in cumulatively uh, to the reported stated charge of the Tesla. Uh, I'm getting a feel for it and I'm seeing about 212 amp hours um, and um, at a average voltage of 3.6 volts times 96, um, 3.6 times 96 is 345.6 times uh, about 212 amp hours is what I've got it down to. Um, that looks like, sounds like to me a 73 kilowatt hour battery. Now your mileage may vary. Um, but what the main battery I've got most of this done on had 5,000 miles on it when it was salvaged. It's a new battery. Um, and so I'm not seeing 85 kilowatt hours. If you want to call it an 85 kilowatt hour battery because Elon Musk does, that's fine. You're not going to get that out of the battery. However, a 73 kilowatt hour battery that you can use essentially all of, but certainly 80% of that uh, routinely, which would be uh, times 0.8, um, 58 kilowatt hours. Uh, most of you are, are familiar with having 50 kilowatt hour batteries you've bought and getting to use half of that, or 25 kilowatt hours. Um, in this case, um, you could take 50 or 55 kilowatt hours out of that pack on a daily basis and I think it would last, uh, well, I don't know how long it would last, a long time. Uh, and, it, and, and it would not diminish in capacity the way that lead acid uh, batteries do. Of course, the normal advantages of lithium ion over uh, lead acid perhaps not as long-lived and, and robust as the LiPo4 cells we're, we're accustomed to, but these batteries will, uh, will do and they'll do for a long time. So I'm pretty excited about uh, the full pack. Uh, we've got a uh, controller now that other hands are fabricating, uh, which makes them a lot prettier inside and out than mine do. Our testing is going well. Our software features and reliability are way out ahead of what I've done with the modules. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the rig I want to work is the uh, full pack uh, controller with simple inverters. I've got a 5 kilowatt, a 10 kilowatt, and a 20 kilowatt here. Actually a 5, two 10s, and a 20 that are all kind of dumb inverters <clears throat> and do exactly what I tell them to. And we'll do it in the 300 to 400 volt range to produce power. Um, and so we're pretty happy with it. But that's the report on uh, high current transfers between batteries and ultimately this will apply to cars um, that you can do um, significant, uh, fairly wide range 
of uh, transfers, but transfers into a Tesla battery uh, beyond uh, 300 amps, certainly beyond 275 amps, simply fail. And not catastrophically, it just shuts down and won't take it. Uh, and the get well is charge it up a little closer to the other one and do it again. Stay with us. Okay, boys and girls, I'm uh, back on a Sunday afternoon trying to shoot video by myself. Don't try this at home. Um, we have further Tesla news. Um, I've been advised by Tesla that my Model 3 reservation is ready to be filled out. An additional uh, $2,500 deposit to be made not refundable to uh, refresh your memory on the uh, evening of the first day where they were taking reservations for Tesla all day they had people in line at Tesla service centers and showrooms who were able to uh, uh, put in a reservation for a Tesla Model 3 the rest of us had to wait till the beginning of the presentation online that evening at eight o'clock, I think. Um, I reserved two reservations within the first 15 minutes. And I get a little bit of a bump on one of them because I already own a Model S. Well, the one reservation came uh, available um, this past week and I uh, was allowed to pick my colors uh, kind of a Henry Ford thing going on there um, with the uh, color black being free all other colors being a thousand except for two metallics that were 1500 extra I've always liked black cars anyway I have a black Tesla Model S and so I thought it would be kind of an interesting to contrast the two of them by getting it black as well I did uh, manage the uh, $5,000 interior upgrade with the 12-way power seat, the powered mirrors, um, a number of interior upgrades, including a pretty stout stereo system, and I opted for that. There was another $5,000, I think, for uh, having all the hardware you would need for advanced autopilot. And you kind of had to buy that when you bought the car. Uh, it could be added on later, but it was an addition, higher charge. And, um, and then the advanced autopilot features they have now was another four or $5,000. Recall that the Roadster had been originally a $109,000 car. It quickly got to be about $126,000. And the concept discussed by Elon Musk directly was that the Model S would be a more production car sold at $55,000. There were not any, as in not one, Model S ever sold for $55,000. And indeed, mine in 2013 was 107,000 and change. Uh, the Model 3 is purports to be a uh, $35,000 car. And mine, uh, the reservation number one, has the long range battery, uh, as they all kind of do. They, they've kind of got it upsold uh, quite a bit anyway and that you have to have long-range battery and some other features uh, to be in among the first Model 3 owners but with the upgrades I selected including the 19-inch wheels and all the autopilot things uh, it's $55,500 almost exactly the price the Model S was supposed to be on introduction but I might say a few dollars uh, shy of being a $35,000 car. Again, I support Musk's concept of setting aggressive targets, but in the case of the pricing, I actually find all this quite disingenuous. 
there will never be a Tesla Model S sold at $55,000. There never was a Model S sold at $55,000. And there will never be a Model 3 sold at $35,000. It's simply a fantasy, but it's also a direct quote by the head of the company both times. And I find that essentially dishonest. Uh, I would prefer he say we are going to target the $35,000 range and, and try to get there with our most basic model. Um, but he's pretty much promised that price and touted that price um, instead, and there will never be a Model 3 at $35,000. It's uh, February. We do have some information about Tesla um, from 2017 sales. I found a couple of things notable. There are claims that Tesla had sold 103,000 cars in uh, 2017. Uh, Tesla Porter 4 sales, Model S of 15,200. Model X, which is a more expensive car, but barely trailing at 13,120 and 1,550 Model 3s um, for 29,870 cars and about 103,000 in 2017. Total U.S. deliveries were 50,147, so U.S. sales of Tesla cars are just slightly under 50%, and I find that kind of astounding in a startup company that in uh, the eight or nine years Tesla's actually been in production that they have have done this aggressively on a global scale such that U.S. sales are just slightly under half of their total um, at this point. They've produced over 300,000 Teslas. But they have 455,000 reservations for the Model 3. So that should make them the largest producer of electric cars in the world. Uh, would you believe they're not? The Chinese believe that the 21st century is the century of China. And after dealing with them, selling to them, buying from them, and observing them, I have to say they've kind of got me convinced. A few years ago, they were trying to get electric car sales off the ground, and uh, they sold 34 that year, I remember, in spite of changing the registration laws in Beijing to favor electric vehicles. Now they're talking about banning uh, fossil fuel vehicles and have done quite a bit. A company called BYD has made a uh, car, an electric car, some buses too. Let's see, what did they call the car? I'll uh, put up a picture of it here on the, uh, the screen. I am struggling with my computer. The BAICEC series of um, BYD, uh, and they are now producing more cars uh, than Tesla. I don't know if that can be maintained in the face of the Model 3, but right now Tesla, uh, BYD is technically the largest manufacturer of electric cars in the world. I've gone on and on and on about the Chevy Volt, the Chevy Bolt, the Nissan Leaf, um, VW's uh, pretensions to the throne, and so forth. But at this point, 
BYD appears to be the number one electric car manufacturer in the world. And Tesla is a close number two. California State Assembly maker, uh, uh, member uh, Phil Ting has introduced Bill AB 1745, titled Clean Cars 2040, that uh, mandate that all passenger vehicles after 2040 be uh, zero emission. As you know, I don't uh, really believe in all that uh, horse hockey of governmental uh, intervention in these things. But it's interesting that in the land of fruits and nuts, um, they very much do, and like China, are going to be, and India and the UK are going to mandate out the uh, uh, sale of new fossil fuel cars. Of course, all of these mandates uh, are out in the future enough that we can, of course, change them if we need to. They're not going to matter. Um, the changeover from fossil fuel cars to electric cars. The way th these adoption curves work is they kind of creep up on you a little bit at a time and then they go vertical. By the time the lawmakers can react, um, the vast majority of um, cars will be uh, manufactured as electric. And there's not much point in having a law to uh, restrict the sale of a few uh, gas guzzlers that people might want for whatever reason they want them. So it's not uh, particularly um, interesting to me uh, what the lawmakers do about it. My sense always in the past in technology has been the, the Friday, Tuesday deal. Friday, it just looks like we're not going to get there. And by Tuesday, it appears to be over. And by the way, there aren't any available for cash. You can't get one. Uh, the world just goes crazy. And that will probably be replicated again here. I don't think this year or the next, uh, but 2021, 2022, the, the benefits of electric cars um, will become evident to the entire population. Most of the objections will be eliminated. And, uh, and the price of the cars as it gets into volume production will actually be less than the cost of a fossil fuel car. There's simply a lot fewer parts, just a, a much lower parts count in an electric car than there is in a gasoline fired car. Of course, uh, let's all chant the mantra, they're quieter, they're more powerful, they don't use uh, motor oil or uh, fuel, uh, gasoline fuel, um, less maintenance. No, there, there's no such thing as zero maintenance, but much less maintenance issues. Um, and all in all, a simpler, more efficient, more elegant way of uh, achieving personal transportation. About four and a half times more efficient at converting a given amount of energy into forward motion. Ergo, our uh, nine-year devotion to the topic. I had also predicted, as we tend to uh, focus on solar, I know the last uh, year, and some of our EV guys are wanting to know about when the uh, Cadillac Escalade will be done. Well, Bill Bayer was back this week. Um, it stopped in for a visit, looking thinner with a beard, kind of a Duck Dynasty thing going on. And I don't think he's coming back yet. He hadn't really got a belly full of Tennessee yet, but that's coming. And I kind of wanted to save that project for him. I don't know why they leave me. I don't know why they come back. Uh, I'm not very good with people, but I've kind of saved the Escalade uh, for him. And uh, we're kind of a little bit focused on electricity 
and uh, solar home solar applications at the moment and here is kind of why uh, this this just in the 50 states of solar report 2017 annual review and q4 update edition now available it's only about seventeen hundred and fifty dollars but they do share highlights I don't normally do this, but I'm just going to read them off to you because this goes to a prediction I made several years ago that we would wind up on our buddies with the utility companies who were very supportive of the whole concept of using electricity to drive cars, particularly charging at night during low peak periods, have uh, become the enemy. Uh, it's not really showing up in electric cars yet. It will, but man, are they after the solar guys. 84 utilities in 2017, 84 utility requests in 35 states plus the District of Columbia to increase monthly fixed charges or minimum bills on all residential customers by at least 10% were pending or decided. The utility company's view of solar goes like this. Our rates are based on our expectation that you will use X electricity. If we install electricity to your home and use less, um, we don't get our fair share. <laughs> and so you're in a sense kind of a free rider and so the other um, uh, utility companies kind of have to pay for you to be on our grid um, I, the whole thing is convoluted but that's the concept so one of their strategies is to simply increase the basic charge that they apply to your utility bill whether you use any electricity or not that'll help flatten it out 31 states plus dc considered or enacted changes to distributed generation compensation policies that is uh, how they pay um, homeowners for um, their generated solar electricity 21 states plus district columbia formally examined or resolved to examine some element of the value of distributed generation or the costs and benefits of net metering more on that in a minute but net metering is where um, you use electricity from the grid that goes through the meter you produce electricity it goes in the, the meter and it should make it turn backwards more on that in a moment and then if you turn it backwards beyond what um, uh, you used um, the utility company pay you uh, some fee for the uh, electricity uh, they want to change that. It's not really what they want to do. 21 states took policy action on community solar. Not too sure what that's about. 19 utility requests in 10 states to add new or increase existing charges specific to rooftop solar customers were pending or decided. Eight states had policy action on third party solar ownership laws or regulations. Third party ownership is kind of what Solar City did. They would install and own the electric plant on your roof and, and then sell you electricity at a um, lower cost than the utility company. Uh, and usually a fixed cost that would not go up. Kind of pinning the utility company's rates, a rate increaseability. Six states had action on utility-owned rooftop solar policy to program. But if somebody's going to do that, in other words, install a plant on your roof and, um, and charge you for it, it really should be the utility company, don't you think? Yes. And uh, so this is just a uh, overview of 30,000 feet of all the legislative requests lobbying and uh, application of utility companies across the country to um, attack uh, your ability to 
uh, generate your own electricity on your own roof. I had warned of this. Um, I uh, would like to be not correct, uh, but I will be. Uh, it, it, it's just human nature. They want to, it's kind of like the FBI covering their ass, uh, uh, having done wrongdoing. Uh, the utility companies uh, want to protect their turf and your ability to generate electricity while laudable, a public good, good for all of us, the utility companies don't view it as good for them. I'm not too sure that's true, but I'm sure that they believe it's true. Um, let's talk about net metering and net billing. I have actually caught Ameren UE uh, in applying net billing to me uh, while I have a net metering agreement with them in force. And that's going to be the subject of a uh, uh, little meet net, the function at the junction with the Public Utilities Commission in St. Louis. Net, uh, what they want is net billing. This was not an accident. Uh, they're going to pretend confusion. They're not confused. Net metering, as I described, is you get electricity from the utility company, let's say at the national average of 11.75 cents per kilowatt hour, and you uh, produce electricity and put it into the grid, and that rolls back the meter at the same 11.75 cents a kilowatt hour. But if you reach parity, in other words, you've put in as much as you've taken out, any excess is done at a much lower rate. Now, should it be at a much lower rate? I would posit that it should be at a much higher rate. It should be the rate they pay peaker plants now, which is 35 cents a kilowatt hour. But they have sold the concept of an avoided cost of production. Um, which is their amount they spend on coal to produce electricity. And so uh, anything over what I use is uh, at the uh, avoided cost. Actually, it's a little over two cents now uh, here in Missouri. It was 1.75 cents, but we've actually had a, a rate increase. And so it's over two cents for the avoided cost of production. Net billing is a little different. And if you have one of the new meters that measures both directions, you're either getting net billing or you're about to. Because it doesn't spin the meter backwards, it tracks your utility usage coming in and it tracks your utility production going out. And what they wanna do there is go to net billing where it sounds like net metering, but it's not. <laughs> You pay the 11.75 cents for anything you get in, and you get the two cents for anything you put back. Um, and so you're kind of penalized nine cents, 9.75 cents uh, on the, the amount that you um, were offsetting of your own usage. You don't get retail for that that you don't use anymore. Uh, and I, I think this, a completely bizarre, tortured um, twist of logic, but it works for the utility company. So watch in your area that you're uh, being converted from net metering to net billing. They are not the same and by a lot. Um, and so that's uh, that. I would note that in a couple of days, Tesla is going to uh, have launch of their Falcon Heavy. Um, I may have mentioned that in an earlier segment, but it's been updated. Uh, they are going to launch uh, Elon Musk's personal red uh, Tesla Roadster, the first car he had delivered personally, into a solar elliptical orbit that will uh, kind of vary between Earth orbit and Mars orbit um, in perpetuity. Uh, it will be playing um, music on the uh, uh, radio until the batteries give out. Can't remember what the song was. The uh, Falcon Heavy is really three Falcon 9s, 
total of 27 Merlin engines, five million pounds of thrust, and uh, sort of equal in cargo capacity to a Boeing 747, but into orbit. It's the uh, uh, heaviest lifter since the Saturn V last launched in 1973, the year I graduated high school. So this is uh, a big deal. More of a big deal in that the two side boosters are gonna detach early in the game and land back on shore. And the uh, third booster, the center, center booster, after delivering its payload is also going to land on a platform at sea. And ideally all three uh, segments be recoverable. What are the odds of that all going off and all three of them landing? Well, I think even Elon Musk thinks pretty slim, but that's the target and that's where he wants to eventually get to is that that happens every time. Again, I don't think we're going to Mars, but I think that we are going to uh, launch communication satellites in large groups to achieve 4,000 uh, some satellites and a gigabit planet-wide internet that will be amazingly profitable um, and amazingly um, functionally uh, capable. Basically gigabit internet to your phone. Basically gigabit communications to your phone globally where the entire planet is a local calling area. Um, probably going to be at a premium price initially, $300 or $400 a month, but it basically strands $3 trillion in investment in uh, fiber optics and cell phone towers, which shortly thereafter will be viewed as quaint. So that's the uh, Falcon thing. We have, of course, been involved in solar, but our work has been in batteries. What's this device? Uh, we accepted a commission from an aviation company in Canada. Uh, they have a very interesting project, which is why I accepted it. Uh, as you know, I'm a helicopter pilot. A helicopter and some firefighters. And they uh, have developed a device, or are developing a device, that I found most interesting. It, the helicopters typically uh, carry a sling device that they fill with water uh, from a pond and then dump it on the fire. They don't have the capacities that, of, of course, the larger airplanes sprayers do. But they're pretty good at spot targeting things. Uh, what they're developing is a pod that uh, hangs down and again they uptake water uh, hovering over a pond. Mix in some aerating agent which is a sort of a cattle blood protein that causes foaming and um, release it into the air and that blows it into foam which has a greater firefighting capacity and of course for a given amount of water a much larger blanket. Uh, they have an idea to uh, increase that foam level by force blowing it with like 32 fans uh, in a sudden uh, blowout of this uh, water uh, with a lot of air and making kind of a super foam. I like that idea. In fact, I think it's a very good idea. The problem is they need 750 amps of 48 volts to uh, make that happen. And there's nothing on a helicopter that'll generate that. And so they need a battery, and we have agreed to try to develop one. This is the uh, battery in question, and I have designed it uh, using a Tesla Model S um, uh, module and one of our controllers. Um, we've got a Rebling aviation connector here that can carry that amount of current for uh, the 30 seconds or so required. Uh, they want a capacity to be able to go fetch more water 
do another blow and do maybe 50 of these with a battery. Uh, there'll be two of these uh, running the blower and a third one um, running the pump uh, to uh, suck it up. Um, this is a, uh, of course, a uh, uh, military style handle. Um, we've got a lid with a couple of uh, butterfly hasps here that uh, draw the lid down. Um, we've got some trim edge on there that uh, does kind of a, uh, a seal on it. This is a Cutler Hammer slap switch, an emergency switch. Normally you slap it to turn it on um, and pull it out to uh, uh, slap it to turn it off, pull it out, turn it on. I've got this one wired backwards. Um, it will energize the system and as it comes up and closes the contactor, it will uh, glow. Um, why did I do that? I like this switch. It's a big switch. It's bright, uh, but this thing's kind of kind of being a pod open to the air, bird strike or something slaps it. I don't want it shutting off the battery. If they want it to be the other way, it's a, a very minor wiring change to make it operate in reverse. No changes to software necessary. This is a uh, IP67 ethernet. Uh, or uh, Cat5, Cat6, RJ45 connector. And that's what we're going to um, across the product line for CAN connections. And uh, what I am doing is putting 12 volts on pin 1, ground on pin 8, CAN high on pin 4, the blue wire, and um, uh, CAN low on pin 5, the blue and white one and we're setting up all our devices to work that way. Here's another military style connector with two pins and that's for our 12 volt and switch ground charge enable signal. And then this is um, a IP67 um, USB port from a micro printer port, uh, mini printer port, uh, mini B, and that's how we'll connect to it with our um, laptop to make configuration changes or to mon monitor the battery operation. I've got another end of this somewhere. So this is our uh, EVTV hardened battery controller version 1.0 uh, software. Here we see our battery voltage temperature and our second temperature. It sells voltage. So 114.158, 4.088, And what we have here is some balancing going on. We're suppressing right now cell 5. And uh, see here cell 2 um, in a balancing thing that occurs when we're above 5 amps charging and above a certain uh, I think 3.9 volts. We got no volts. Our module voltage is 24.83. Average cell 4.14. Average temperature 25.58. We're at 97 percent state of charge. Charging in a current of 16.39 or 406 watts, not too impressive, but we're uh, actually tapering down from reaching our voltage. Um, and uh, we're at 4 amp hours used per 97% state of charge. Um, max system charge current will work up to 23.27 amps. Keep in mind, this is 120 volts AC at 240, it'll be twice that. Max pack voltage is about now 24.84. Our high cell, our low cell. Configured capacity. Um, contactors on, no voltage or temperature alarms, charge enables on. 
And at the bottom, this only appears when you're charging. <coughs> AC charger reports charging at 16 amps. 25 volts DC charging at 2520. I can enter a question mark here. Get our configuration screen. So we can toggle the contactor, the charge enable, clear module faults, erase our EPROM, <coughs> print our login to screen. Z resets our state of charge to 100%. Our CAN speeds, uh, battery ID and inverter, probably we don't need. Capacity and amp hours lets us manually play with the limits of our battery. Parallel number one, we only have one module here. High voltage and low voltage cutoff, variance cutoff, high temp cutoff, low temp cutoff. Our cutoff voltage is for charge enable output or our charging can message and resume. Sensitivity, how many alarms can we have go off, spurious alarms before we uh, trip the contact. Our log interval. Show you our log. We can save quite a bit of data to EEPROM. This gives us our day, hour, and minute. And we're logging every minute the voltage, current, current amp hours, and our state of charge. Probably the interest will be current voltage as we try to get 750 amps out of this. We're going to do that for 30 seconds. I'll probably change this software to do a fast um, log uh, every 20 seconds or so and, uh, and see how that works. Uh, their logging is going to be a little different from our solar uh, situation, so we're going to need fast logging. And that's... Uh, we also have a, another log version, which is just lowercase l. And that gives us a comma-separated version that we can use with Microsoft Excel. And that will work pretty well. And that's, uh, that's about our uh, software for the uh, helicopter battery. I have made this little device, which is a uh, hub. It's really just a Cat6 hub. I've got it wired up to carry the ground and the 12 volts and the can high and low across eight ports. And it's got a weather cover uh, for the uh, um, RJ45. You just plug in the RJ45 as normal and screw this on to uh, give it kind of a little bit of weather seal or foam seal <laughs> whatever you want there and then this will act as a hub this is our EVIC display that I've already demonstrated uh, for the um, um, Tesla full pack and our module thing and so I can uh, plug this in here and we should shortly get a uh, little readout of our uh, battery let me lean that up against there see if you can see it Take it a second to uh, initialize. What else do I have here in the goodie bag? Oh, this is uh, a little connector here. Uh, again, a military style connector that uh, will go on to uh, this uh, connection. And I just heard the relay close. Um, the other end of this just has a, uh, a relay that you can hook uh, things up to to turn them on 
or off. And by things, uh, I would normally mean a charger or a solar uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's to use chargers that um, do not uh, operate with can. We're not going to uh, need that. Uh, basically, let's see, I'm at 93% state of charge, 24.1 volts. My high cell is 4.01. My low is 4. I'm at 24 degrees uh, Celsius, and I'm uh, discharging at about 9 amps. And what I'm discharging into through here is a little Peltier cooler uh, that I'm using as a load just to do this. Let me uh, shut this off and show you our charger. This is a little 1.8 kilowatt charger. And uh, I'm going to see if I can find the other end of this thing. Plug that with its T handle into here. And uh, I've got another ethernet cable out of this that I'll plug into our little breakout box and let's turn this thing on again so I do have a uh, charger uh, here a little 1.8 kilowatt uh, charger that'll go down uh, to uh, sufficiently low voltage to charge this battery even from about 17 volts. Uh, it plugs in here to my uh, hub again uh, with an Ethernet cable. It goes into a connector into the charger and of course the power is connected with the Rebling. And uh, Right now we're at 57% state of charge and not charging. I have the charge enable off. I'm going to set that to on and uh, we'll start charging a little bit um, and you'll be able to see the current coming up uh, here in the lower bar uh, on the EVIC display. I don't know if that's going to be visible on camera very well. I'll do some close-ups to add. And it very slowly comes up. We're at 4 amps now. Um, and it comes up quite slowly, but it's under can control. And so we can set the uh, um, voltage it charges to. Actually, it'll charge to our cutoff voltage. Um, and... Uh, and it'll taper from that. Um, so um, I can set that cutoff, um, you know, a little lower and let it uh, uh, completely charge and do the constant current, constant voltage charge, or get it to cut off uh, entirely. I haven't determined exactly how I want to do that. It's important to be able to charge batteries to the same level. Now they will balance from cell to cell, but they're going to string two of these batteries in parallel and run them together. Uh, one of the things is they want some indication that it's running out of charge, and I have made provisions with this screen to do this. I can manually change the amp hour level that we uh, show, and so the state of charge, right now I'm showing uh, 57%. I'm going to change my amp hour level to uh, 0165. 
You know, that brings me down to what have I got our capacity set at? Capacity, um, I've got about 183 um, amp hours demonstrated in this uh, pack. Let's set amp hours equal to uh, 120. That's about 34%. Notice that um, this light is on steady. I'm going to change that to uh, amp hours equals uh, 125. And that's going to show us at about 31. So amp hours equals 130. That brings us down to 28%. You notice the light is uh, slowly flashing uh, and that tells you that you're under 30% state of charge. Let's go to amp hours equals 135 and you should see it flash just a little bit faster and in fact that flashing will change in linear fashion from 30% down to 0%. I'm at 26% here. Um, Let's go to 150. That drops me to 18%, and you can see it's flashing some faster. Um, pH at 170 amp hours, we would be at 7% state of charge, and it would look like this. And let's go to 180. And we're at 1.64% uh, state of charge, and you can see that the light is flashing quite briskly. This is to give, um, oh, primarily ground crew, uh, a visual indication of the state of charge of the pack. Um, if it's on steady, it's above 30% state of charge. And I would say that's where you want to be. Um, in most flight regimes. Uh, if it's flashing, it needs charging. And um, so they can uh, pretty much do multiple runs. And if they use the uh, this, it'll tell them pretty much where they're at. But when you're charging the battery, uh, you can also um, watch the uh, flashing light until it... Uh, I may change that to uh, also a flash in the top 10% uh, say of the charge where it starts flashing when you're at 90% and it's flashing quite quickly um, as you approach full charge. Uh, that might be interesting. But it just gives us another visual for a state of charge. And so we have our USB connection and our screen, very similar to the other uh, Tesla monitor screens that shows us individual cell voltages and everything. Our um, CAN uh, screen shows us our high uh, cell at 4.13 and our low cell at 4.0. We're charging at 23 amps now, and that's on 120 uh, volts AC on 240, uh, uh, 120 volts AC at 240 volts AC. It'll do about twice that, a little over 40 amps uh, into this battery pack, charge it in about four hours. Um, we show our two temperatures, we show our state of charge, and we show our, our battery pack voltage. And so, in theory, they could run that to the cockpit. Um, of course, in flight, they don't need the breakout box or the charger, um, and that will uh, give them an indication in flight of uh, where their uh, battery is. Of course, they need three of these displays for three batteries. That may be cockpit overkill, but it uh, certainly could be done. 
And so again, this is a prototype device for a uh, helicopter uh, firefighting tool that I think they're on to something and so have invested quite a bit of time um, in uh, developing a uh, battery for them that would be um, uh, based on Tesla battery modules and so you get the um, efficiency of the uh, uh, weight, uh, the energy density of the Tesla battery module. The power density, these Tesla batteries can put out 1100 amps momentarily that remains to be seen can they do 720 or 750 amps for 30 seconds i think that's going to be an extreme test of them uh, and i believe that it could lead to some thermal issues but we really don't have the luxury of the weight and complexity of a cooling system and my uh, hope is uh, that that temperature incursion um, is going to uh, be uh, sufficiently controlled that then in uh, 15 or 20 minutes it takes to uh, go get another load and come back to blow that uh, that the battery will have recovered temperature wise uh, and that we don't need to do any uh, auxiliary cooling of the battery uh, that's kind of a guess, and it's just going to require some testing uh, to see. We could add ports uh, to do external cooling, um, but it's going to be uh, an additional level of complexity and weight that they don't need. Uh, we're at 82.8 pounds on this device. It's, uh, oh, let me see here. We're 33 inches long, 16 inches wide, and five and five eighths inch thick, and weigh 82.8 pounds. Um, I would suggest that most of your solar installations do not need the significant expense of this kind of enclosure. Rebling connectors, um, mill spec uh, connectors and, and ports. Um, however, in a, in a helicopter, a firefighting environment. Um, I think this uh, design of the battery could make their product in turn very attractive to uh, firefighters and aviation authorities when dealing with uh, lithium batteries. Uh, the batteries away from the aircraft, uh, rather contained in this box, and um, and and uh, in fact. If it exceeds certain temperature levels and they can set them on the current output of the uh, uh, device, um, it will automatically disconnect. In fact, they can set their current limit on the output and their uh, temperature limit. Now that's not going to control anything, but it will disconnect it uh, in the event. Have one contactor, no pre-charge. Now why would that be? Rather than a capacitive input, as we face with our inverters and, and solar chargers, uh, this is going to be connected to an inductive output, a series of uh, fan motors. And when we turn it on, rather than spiking um, in current, it's actually going to resist the current um, and it'll have to build um, based on the... Uh, voltage in uh, what in this case is going to be a rather huge inductor of 32 um, different uh, uh, devices. So I don't think we need pre-charge and we have one contactor in here. However, it's one of our Gigavac uh, GX16 series. Uh, those are rated for 600 amps continuous and 1800 volts. Um, so well able to withstand any uh, voltage spike from that inductive load and um, rather able to uh, shut off um, uh, even uh, any, any current they could conceivably do. We do have uh, uh, Mersen fuse uh, internal to the device. 
there's a DC to DC converter. This switch actually applies the battery voltage to the DC to DC converter, which in turn um, powers our um, EVTV can do board and, uh, and shield. Um, and, and that brings up the system and starts to control it. Um, the main innovation is the lighting on this is controlled by one of our outputs on that board so we can uh, cycle it based on state of charge. Um, the CAN uh, is at 250 kilobits per second. It runs our um, device here, our display device, and our charger, uh, but you could easily um, add additional uh, CAN uh, devices and uh, uh, circuitry to do anything you want. Uh, we would probably have to change some code in the device to, to give them control over CAN of uh, configuration items and so forth, but we could do that. And uh, so it's a, a prototype type thing, and, uh, and I've got uh, hopes for it. It's of personal interest to me as a helicopter pilot and firefighter. Um, the, uh, and so I think uh, uh, we're going to do everything we can to help this company uh, develop a uh, uh, competitive product um, the, uh, for the or helicopter firefighting. We have a uh, very interesting uh, development in uh, this control of Tesla battery modules. Uh, one of our first uh, applications was an unusual one in that he wanted to do a full battery, but had an existing uh, system that worked on 48 volts. Does this sound familiar to anyone? And um, so we uh, sold the pieces to a, uh, uh, a gentleman named uh, Thomas Massey, who is actually a congressman for the eastern uh, uh, area of uh, Kentucky uh, in the U.S. Congress, but also an MIT trained uh, double E engineer. And uh, he didn't have any problem at all uh, putting together the uh, uh, kit of basically components uh, that I sent him. Uh, and in fact, he uh, indicates in his video, he purchased the battery from a guy in Florida. He, that's who supplied it. He bought the battery from us. Uh, and we do now offer uh, full packs and uh, uh, modules uh, through the store, but they're actually um, shipped from um, Mike in, uh, in Georgia. And uh, so we teamed with him. Uh, we're trying to put together a full line of basically Tesla batteries, um, which I don't really want to handle myself, but you want to buy them, so that's... Uh, uh, what we're going to do, and uh, and controls to control it. Mr. Massey made a video, and it's a lot better than the ones I've made. So let's have a look and see what he did with his uh, battery upgrade from lead acid to a full Tesla Model S pack uh, using our uh, uh, control module for uh, Tesla Model S modules. Let's take a look. Hi, it's Thomas Massey here. Some of you may recognize me as a congressman for Kentucky's 4th District, but this video isn't about politics. This video is about a quest of mine. It's January 1st, 2018, 9 a.m. We just rang in the new year, and this morning I am driving to Georgia to pick up a very important ingredient in something uh, that I plan to build this week. For five years, I've been driving this Tesla, but for 10 years, my family and I have lived off the grid. Our house has been running on lead acid batteries, about half the capacity of the pack that's in this car. I would love to have the ability to run my house off of the batteries that are in this Tesla, but there's two problems. Number one, they're in my car, 
and I can't buy these batteries that are available in this Tesla. Tesla will sell you a power wall, but they are not selling it to people who live off the grid presently. My goal of integrating a Tesla type battery into our off-grid power system has developed a new sense of urgency. The lead acid batteries that have been powering our house at night are now on their last legs. They are emitting their dying gasps of electrons and their capacity is probably about one eighth of what it was when they were new. Now, for years, I've been anxiously reading and awaiting the Tesla announcements uh, about their Powerwall, and I think it's going to be a great system. The problem is it's not available to people who are off the grid, and I need one this month. So I am going to try and build my own Powerwall. I think I can do it for about half the price per kilowatt hour of the commercially available power wall, but more importantly, it will be compatible with my 48 volt off-grid system. So there are basically two steps in building your own power wall. Number one, you have to acquire a big honking Tesla battery. And number two, you have to integrate that into your home power system hopefully without burning your house down, electrifying yourself, or uh, wasting a lot of hard-earned money. Right now I'm going to focus on the first part of the mission, which is to acquire the battery. Now at first, I had the idea that I could just buy a wrecked Tesla and take the battery out of it. You see, Tesla sold tens of thousands of Model S vehicles and hundreds of them have been wrecked and many of those beyond repair. And I've seen them at auctions for sale. In fact, uh, I bid on one of these cars in the hopes of purchasing it for less than what the battery was worth to me. I even looked at a car and almost bid on a car but decided that the battery might be junk. So I decided not to bid on that car. But in the process of watching these cars sell at auction, I have decided that um, it's almost impossible to buy one of these cars for less than what the battery is worth. Now, can you buy one of these cars for less than the sum of the value of its parts, including its battery? Yes. So I could go to an auction site and buy a wrecked Tesla with a salvage title and and get the battery out of that but I would still have several thousands of dollars to recoup beyond the value of the battery and therefore I would have to go into the business of selling door handles and dashboards and wheels and brakes and motor drive systems in order to recoup the value of that salvage Tesla um, and come out ahead on the battery. So what I've decided to do is to find somebody who's already in the business of taking apart salvaged Teslas and removing the batteries and selling all of the parts of the Tesla. And from that person, I want to buy the battery only. I found one of these batteries and uh, one of these individuals who's selling this battery in Georgia today, and that's why I'm headed down there. Now. Hopefully I'm not buying a brick, a 1300 pound brick, which is what this battery would be if it's not serviceable. But I have reasonable confidence that this is a good battery because the person who salvaged the battery was able to get the screen of the Tesla to come on and to show that the salvaged Tesla had 32,000 miles on it when it was totaled and also that the battery had 208 miles of charge on it when the car was totaled. So I have reasonable confidence that this is not a brick that I am going to 
put on my trailer back there and tow back to Kentucky today. And that's important because I am paying $15,000 for this battery. Now that sounds like a ridiculous amount of money, but keep in mind, I don't pay any electric bills and this battery should last me at least 10 years, hopefully 15 years. And uh, a comparable lead acid battery, which is a, a far inferior technology, would cost about the same price per kilowatt hour. So that's why I'm headed to Georgia. It's about 450 miles from my house. I'm over 100 miles into this voyage. I'm almost to Tennessee right now. Pick up this battery, head back to the house, and then begin the process tomorrow of disassembling this battery and reconfiguring it for 48 volts because the Tesla battery in its native format is a 400 volt battery but it has 16 modules inside of it each of which are about 24 volts a piece that uh, can be individually removed and reconfigured into a 48 volt battery which is what I hope to do over the course of the next week. Yeah. You can see it's riding high without a battery in it. Well, that was that high because I think it's in jack mode. Yeah, oh, okay. Air ride is yeah. In jack mode. It, it, it was that high when I bought it in. But it doesn't look too badly damaged, but. This is the donor car. It's had a rough life, but... I imagine the, if you had to pay the bill to fix it, you might want to part it out too. The battery's going to get a second life. January 2nd, the battery has arrived. Hi, it's day two of my DIY Powerwall quest. Yesterday on January 1st, I drove 450 miles to Georgia and picked up a Tesla battery out of a salvaged Tesla and uh, brought it back here to Kentucky, another 450 miles. So that was a long day. It's January 2nd and I'm gonna start wrecking this battery. Hopefully I can get it broken down into all the modules today. The guy that I bought the battery from is a super nice guy. His name is Mike. This was his fourth Tesla that he has salvaged and he drives a Tesla. Mike was able to show me the salvaged Tesla that he took the battery out of. and It was actually in really good shape. It was in better shape than, than my Tesla over here and had fewer miles. It looked like a salvageable car. The uh, fenders, both front fenders, the hood, and all the grill work and, and some of the cooling radiators in the front were all busted, but it, it didn't look like it had a bent frame or any of the A-pillars or the um, rear fenders. None of those were damaged, but these are really expensive cars to fix because the, the used parts are expensive and the uh, aluminum bodywork is expensive to perform. So he made the decision to salvage uh, the parts off of it. And uh, obviously it's probably a pretty good decision. I'm happy with it because I, I've got a good battery here um, that I'm gonna be able to use in the house. Okay, just a couple quick close-ups. This is the Torx bit that has the security feature on it. You can see it's not gonna engage the bolt um, unless it's got the hole in the end of it, because that little nub. 
This is the 10 millimeter Allen key. There are several places on the battery where these big bolts are. And then finally, um, you should take note that this battery is a 400 volt battery. And unless you're trained and know what you're doing, you really shouldn't cut into one of these batteries or open them up. This is the pair of uh, high voltage gloves that I'm going to be wearing when I work on the battery terminals. All right, so here are the 16 modules out of the Tesla battery. It's still uh, leaking a little bit of Tesla juice. Um, that's the coolant that they use uh, for to keep the batteries uniform and to heat them up or to cool them, whatever the case may be. And uh, in this box I just got, is the secret sauce that's going to make it all work. It's from EVTV, Jack Reichard in Missouri. Some connectors. Oh wow. Looks like I got a mug. I didn't order a mug, but I got a mug. That's pretty cool. He's even sent me a satchel. I'm liking this guy already. These are cable harnesses to connect the modules together. A DC to DC converter. And somewhere in here is a computer that can talk to all of this. There's the computer and the all important fuse. It's January 7th and uh, we have success. I'm very excited. Those are all of the voltages in the four modules that I got hooked up thanks to the equipment from EVTV, Jack Reichard in Missouri. I built the uh, this box I put the stuff in this box that he sent I'm calling this Jack in the box so this Jack is the one who came up with all the stuff that's in the box so this box has a positive contactor and a negative contactor there's a pre-charge resistor these are the cables coming in from the battery they will go out from those two terminals to my inverters at 48 volts. But um, the, the magic beans are right here. This is the circuit board that Jack sells that talks to the Tesla modules, the B, specifically the battery management system on each of the Tesla modules. You can see a blinking little light there. That's the battery management system. But um, this is just a test. I just got this working. I'm super excited. Obviously, I don't have all the modules hooked up. I've got four modules hooked up, and I wanted to make sure it worked. Before. I didn't want to blow everything up at once. But um, with four modules working now, I'm going to wire the whole deal together and take it into my battery room and throw out the old lead acid batteries.
This is a quick peek at my inverter system. What you see here, these four deals are Outback inverters. They take 48 volts and they make uh, 120 volts AC from a 48 volt DC battery. Now there are four of them. They are in series parallel so that I can get 240 volts from a pair and this goes into my regular circuit breaker, household circuit breaker box. And uh, then there are two pair of these so that I can get more current, uh, more amperage, if you put them in parallel. Now over here, these are called max power point trackers. These take the voltage from the uh, solar array which right now you can see it's 105 volts, the solar panels, but the battery is at 51.6 volts. So these step down the, the uh, power from a higher voltage to a lower voltage to charge batteries. And so this is all based on 48 volts. The inverters are expecting to see 48 volts from the batteries. The max power point trackers, i.e. Um, the solar panel chargers, they um, expect to charge 48 volt batteries and that's why I had to take the Tesla pack apart. It's a 400 volt battery and rearrange the modules to uh, make it into a 48 volt battery. Now we're going to go in the battery room here. This is just on the other side of the wall. You can see what lead acid batteries look like, and I'll be glad to get rid of these. Um, this is a hydrometer, measures the, the specific gravity of the acid in the batteries to tell you how full the batteries are, because voltage doesn't necessarily tell you the uh, state of the battery on a lead acid battery. This is baking soda in case things get nasty you can throw that on the acid and neutralize things. You would not want to throw that on top of the batteries. These are discarded water containers. This is what it's like to live with a lead acid battery. They use water. They consume water when they get full um, and you're topping them off uh, i.e. charging them they will um, split the water into oxygen and hydrogen and you lose water so you have to replace it. And you can see these batteries are 11 years old. They have a 10 year warranty. Um, here I, I wired around a cell because it just it went totally bad on me. These batteries might have lasted longer if I had put more maintenance into them, um, but uh, these were $12,000 when I bought them 11 years ago, and to replace them would cost $12,000. And rather than live with all this maintenance and this mess, um, I decided to get the Tesla battery, so I won't have to add water to the Tesla batteries. If you're adding water to those, you're doing something wrong. Um, I won't have to mess with you know, taking battery acid out and, and seeing what the specific gravity is of the battery acid. I won't have to worry about having baking soda around. Um, and the Tesla pack will be 85 kilowatt hours of storage, which should be enough to run our house um, three days, even without any solar panels. If um, we had a full eclipse of the sun, it would still provide power for three days. These batteries were about 53 kilowatt hours when they were brand new. Now they're, you know, they're less than 10 kilowatt hours at this point. They're so used up. But today I'm going to be moving these out and rolling those uh, Tesla lithium batteries in here and hoping, hoping to convert the system over. Okay, things are about to get real serious. These are my lead acid batteries. They're all disconnected for good. Never going back. 
That sound you hear in the background is the generator. That's what's running my house. I just hooked up my do-it-yourself Tesla power wall, but I haven't powered up the house yet. I've got the inverters idling and the solar chargers are on. And they, most significantly, they say 48 volts uh, for the battery. That's what the Tesla battery's at. So these are hooked up to the battery. Everything's hooked up, but I haven't switched it over to the house yet. All right, the generator's turned off. The uh, sun is down. It's dark outside. My lead acid batteries are disconnected, but the lights are on. So that means, can only mean one thing. The house is running off Tesla power right now. January 7th. Here is uh, what the system is telling me. It says we're using 1300 watts. Twenty-five amps at forty-eight volts. Um, the system voltage is forty-seven point eight eight, and we've used seventy-two watt hours since I turned the system on. This is pretty daggone exciting. The power wall from a salvaged Model S 85 kilowatt hour car is now functional. So that's uh, a very interesting application. I, of course, in my bubble, think that we should all use full Tesla battery packs uh, at 400 volts in a selfish solar system that treats the utility grid like the hoe they are. And um, that's uh, my take on it. It's not universally accepted. And in fact, what most of the people looking for batteries already are off grid, like, uh, Congressman Massey, um, and entirely wed to 48 volt systems. Why don't I like 48 volt systems? All of the components, uh, the inverters, and the uh, charge controllers um, do a couple of things I don't like. Uh, starting with the photovoltaics, they're all limited to 100 or 150 volt DC photovoltaics. 95% of the solar installations in the United States are actually grid tied, and they're in the 4 to 600 volt range. And there's very little to step it down to 48 volts. Second, configuration. Not their fault. To their credit, the charge controller developers and the inverter developers have tried to be all things to all people and cover lead acid, um, VLR, S, uh, gel cell, um, every kind of lead battery that there is. Uh, the configuration becomes a nightmare. They have gotten in way deeper than they should have on all the different charge faces phases of a lead acid battery. With lithium batteries, we use constant current until we reach a voltage and constant voltage until we drop the current to some value. We don't really need to do that. I've always advocated undercharging your uh, lithium batteries to some degree. And so in recent years, we mostly charge until we reach the voltage and we're done. That's it. We just cut it off. We don't do a lot of the taper charging to achieve 100% uh, state of charge. Uh, so it's a real simple world for us. 
worse 2.1 volts per cell is the voltage of a lead cell. And our lithium cells are nominally 3.6 volts. And that leads to some inequities. Uh, this battery, for example, is really a nominally 21.6, and it's full as a tick at 25 volts. But it, you can discharge it down to 17 and a half or 18 volts uh, quite well. Uh, the uh, equipment normally operates in a different range from that. Two of these side by side would then be 36 volts to 50 volts. Uh, most of that equipment is set up for 44 volts to 56 volts or even 60 volts. Uh, and so the range they have available for using uh, this equipment is a poor match for the actual operating voltages of uh, modern EVs, almost all of which use 3.6 volt cells now. Um, finally, um, Congressman Massey's showing you 1,300 or 1,500 watts. Uh, and he's built his house on the concept of being off-grid and it's a very efficient house where, uh, you know, maybe five kilowatts is all you need. Even at 5,000 watts at 48 volts, you have to have 100 amps of current and that's hard work for the uh, cabling and wiring. 100 amps is a lot of amps. At 50 kilowatts, that becomes a thousand amps. And it's not, a, you know, you, you guys are used to EVs. We can get away with murder on cable sizing and so forth, primarily because we're using short links. But we, we don't hit the, we can do 2,000 amps, but we do it for 12 seconds. Beyond that, you're going half the speed of sound. <laughs> and you have other problems besides your cables getting hot. Uh, we're talking about continuous power um, and at 48 volt systems uh, can easily run a couple of hundred amps uh, continuously doing eight or 10 kilowatts of power. It's uh, heavy, awkward, uh, and dangerous as far as I'm concerned. When you get into the 400 volt range to do 240 volts AC, uh, we're actually stepping down the current um, or stepping it up uh, in the inverter. So we can have very light, I can use very common uh, 12 gauge uh, house wiring to hook the battery up to the inverter um, because uh, we're just not doing that much current. Um, in that case, uh, 10 kilowatts is uh, 25 amps um, from our battery. And so I like the higher voltage uh, systems. I like the idea of using the Tesla battery as it is uh, coming out of the car without having to even take it apart. Um, but when you go to a 48 volt system, there's a huge jump in uh, current. And so those are the three uh, reasons I don't like 48 volt systems. A mismatch with the vast majority of photovoltaics out there. A, a problem matching the operating range of the um, inverters and charge controllers. And uh, just the heft and weight of cabling required to do significant power at 48 volts is daunting to me. Uh, when we're talking about continuous power rather than acceleration. For these reasons, I advocate higher voltage, full electric vehicle bus voltages for our energy storage and really the heart of our system. Uh, as you may know, I've done some work uh, persuading Chinese vendors 
to do some inverters and devices uh, to work with our 400 volt bus. Um, and that's coming very well. We've got some very simple devices that accommodate the range and work very well. I have run into a guy uh, who, in China who's a pretty talented engineer and has a very interesting 12 kilowatt 48 volt inverter, inverter charger that can take AC or uh, from grid or generator and charge batteries and can also, of course, use the batteries to invert to 240 volts AC. Um, we have the Sunny Island and we have the uh, Magnum Power, but the Magnum Power is about 4,400 watts. This is a 12 kilowatt device, probably uh, a few hundred dollars more than the uh, Magnum. I think we can bring it in for 3,000 or 3,500 dollars to have a 12 kilowatt 48 volt inverter uh, that will also charge the batteries. And he's been uh, quite accommodating, actually, in um, dealing with my um, voltage requirements and is working on a version especially for us. A little bit delayed by the Chinese New Year that we suffer through every year from February 5th to the 25th where nothing happens in China while they celebrate their transition from the year of the rooster to the year of the dog, which is, of course, very important uh, to all Chinese everywhere. But um, after that brief vacation, I think we'll be back with uh, something very interesting uh, with regards to a 48 volt inverter. I don't believe in 48 volt inverters. I don't believe in 48 volt systems. I don't think that's the way to go. But you do, so we're going to uh, be able to empower you and enable you to use uh, Tesla battery modules and solar storage in 40 systems. Stay with us, and uh, there's more.